I'm delighted to introduce our final speaker, who isn't so long from waiting up, are you, Roland? So um, thank you very much indeed for being with us across the pond. And a huge role that you hold, the Global Chief Security Officer at TikTok and um, also of Bike Dance. So you bring together an unprecedented understanding and knowledge of global protection and security leadership to one of the world's leading media, social and technology companies. You oversee the company's information protection, risk, workforce protection, crisis management, and investigative security operations worldwide. So a huge task. I do encourage you to um, ask any questions you have in the chat function. Do pose those and we'll come to them throughout the chat. But I'm incredibly grateful, Roland, to you today um, to be doing this for us across the pond. And welcome to you. Thanks, Emma. I'm glad to be here. And uh... It's a, it's a beautiful day out, so I've got plenty of it left to, uh, to go and enjoy. Well, thank you so, so much indeed. So you joined TikTok a year ago, and we'd love to know what have been the most challenging moments so far, and how have you overcome it? Quite an interview question. Yeah, it's, so there's probably a lot, but you know, in, in the context really of the, the, the last discussion, if, if you think about trying to build a global security risk uh, privacy operations group uh, in multiple countries during COVID. Yeah, I've never done that before uh, in, in the middle of a pandemic. So um, certainly COVID has had its unique challenges for my first year. Um, obviously, uh, my focus with um, a lot of the global regulatory uh, focus as well has been around driving transparency. So how are we thinking about uh, how we can deliver tra transparency in the product and in person and trying to build that during a pandemic. So it's been a, it certainly has been an interesting first year. It is absolutely. And I think also when we look at obviously what some of these big check giants have done and so on, and sort of the impact we've seen over the years with them to have had that role and in the pandemic, a lot of children and others, that younger audience being at home, the takeoff of it and so on, been a really interesting time for us all to, to watch. In terms of businesses, businesses tend to accept now that at some point they're going to be hacked. So how can they be transparent when it comes to that actually happening? How can they avoid that reputational risk um, and damage while dealing with that? And sometimes obviously from a regulatory pressure point as well. What, what are your views on that? Yeah, I, take, I guess I take a, a significantly different view. Um, and, and you do hear that all, you know, often. Well, you, you, know, you know, if it's nation state, you're going to get hacked or, or this or that. I mean, it, taking it back to Steve's point, you know, with a military analogy, can you imagine the SAS saying, well, you're not going to get all the hostages all the time, so why train? I mean, you know, train hard, fight hard, right? So our focus should be consistently... Um, being prepared as practitioners, as leaders, our, our focus should be to put in the best and most capable people in place, lead them appropriately, train um, and train again, and, and ensure that we're making sure our technology is correct, that the efficacy of our programs are correct, and, and that we're doing all the right things. So I, I think, number one, um, don't go into it with that view. Second is we really have to be consistent you know, with our with our processes and our technologies, and and we do a lot of uh, here at TikTok, we do a lot of over the horizon uh, threat reviews. Like, what's happening to other people it may not ha be happening to us today, but it could be coming to us or to an agency or to a partner. How are we defending against that? What do our controls look like that would prevent that? Um, okay, now let's practice some you know muscle memory. Let's go out and do incident response. Let's you know test not only the tools, but our people. And um, even around disaster recovery, you know, uh, Netflix had come out with that great concept around the chaos monkey, unplug something, right? See if it actually works, figure it out. Um, so consistently test your teams. And then that third point, which really I think gets to this whole discussion around transparency, which is, I think the disruptor in the industry right now is how do you show? Like, how do you, you know, deliver trust through actually giving tools or programs and in, in, in um, here at TikTok, we've, we have uh, two transparency centers um, under operation, a third being built and a fourth one to ensure that we can do it globally, um, you know, in a, in a follow the sun model. We want people to not just ask, but see, 
come in and view our environment, view our code, view our platforms, view our fusion centers that defend this platform. And, and so we continually to build our programs and our company around the concept of transparency. And when you do that, um, I, I think you you not only garner trust, but you you show the effectiveness of the programs in the business you've built. And Roland, that feels incredibly authentic. It feels something that, you know, as a customer, we really want to hear and see. Do you feel that you're taking those parents, that audience, et cetera, with you? You know, there's a bit, there's a, you've got such an interesting audience, a diverse audience and so on. Do you feel they're coming with you on the journey in the way that others are really feeling that pushback with the other tech giants? Yeah, you know, I, I'm a dad on platform, right? I have two, you know, two beautiful daughters. Um, you know, they they taught me about TikTok <laughs> before I got here, and and the tools and the technologies that we're putting in place for parents. Um, you know, the, the the family connection capabilities, the um, the the privacy tools that we're putting in the hands of users. Those things are all important, but teaching them to use it and letting them know it's there in platform is as important. So I, I think the answer is yes. You, you know, always in, in, in technology organizations, you have multiple um, constituents. You have the community that is the platform. That's, you know, the beauty of whatever you're delivering. And those are, are the key and the primary people that have to understand it and have to trust it. And then you have community leaders and maybe those are regulators or maybe those are, you know, the government entities that are protecting their consumers and their citizens, um, which they should be. And they have an interest in, in a, you know, in different parts of this trust model. So I think we do a great job of it because, you know, quite simply, we're uberly transparent about, you know, what is allowed on platform on the community and what's not. Um, we provide transparency reports to the public. You know, we, we were doing this within two years of opening our business, and which is, which is again, important, doing these things early, often transparent, and, and giving it directly to the users, not just some benign hidden report that, that goes to, to regulators. And I think that's key, isn't it? You know, at the end of the day, we there is that mistrust. And so to have been so open so early on and to have learned from others, I hope is holding you in good stead. If we can look at how do you entrench that security confidence in users and how is that unique in the tech, tech platform space? Could you share a little bit more about that with us, please? This goes back to education. This is a discussion, right? This is a discussion with the, the people that, want to use your technology or your product or your services you're delivering, whatever, whatever you do in, in the industry. Educating and empowering your users, especially with security awareness, and doing it in a way that's meaningful to them, providing them with tools to make their own decisions. Uh, I think that's really important. If you educate people and you give them their the choices and the capabilities to affect the decisions that they want to make, I think um, that's that really gives them an online experience that they understand, that they can engage with, and that they feel a part of. And, and just like engaging with your workforce, giving them information, allowing them to make decisions, listening, and then executing against what you're hearing, those things uh, will all come to bear. And, uh, and I think you know the same thing with your community around privacy and privacy programs. We talked about the transparency and, and accountability centers. We talked about it, transparency reports. Um, think about the security updates that not only we do, but I think most people do on their platforms on a you know, weekly or biweekly basis to ensure that the, the, you know, the programs are updated. And we give those um, out to our communities through these uh, privacy hubs. And, and tips and resources, like, you know, looping it back around. It's all to, to back to communications. Things change in the, in the security risk and privacy space. It's every day things change. Being clear, coming out with blogs, tips, things that people can use, uh, the tools like family pairing to help um, younger children, all of those things, I think, you know, enabling tools that, that help really younger teenagers on platform with restricted mode. These are things we continue to build over time to allow that trust and engagement to happen and for our users to make those decisions. And it feels as though you're far more engaged with those users, far more in communication with them, far more that, if you like, 
available connection rather than someone who's behind closed doors, so to speak. Can I get a sense from you in terms of how does securing a community-based platform differ from consumer-based organizations? Personally, I think it, it's, it's a little easier because you are engaged. Listen, I'm on platform, right? So, you know, when I'm watching, you know, I'm former military, so, you know, I get the military videos or I get the bad dad joke videos, which are great. You know, I, you know it, the, our platform is this really unique capability to have everyone's diversity put out there. And so when you are clear and consistent with what you can and cannot do on platform and you utilize technologies in the program to manage that for the users, I think, I think it's a lot easier. When you have open contact, consumerized platforms or technologies that the users can use um, with no guardrails or no, uh, no constraints, you, be, you end up policing everything not just policing the rules that we've all agreed to on platform. So I, I think in, in some sense, it's, it's a little easier um, if you do have a community guideline group capability to, to really refine what that platform will be used for. Thank you so much. I think obviously you are one CISO, one Chief Information Security Officer amongst many but you are seeing a huge amount for purely from the scale that you have as an organization. What are some of the top security threats the CISOs face in today's threat landscape, do you believe? Uh, so many uh, in so little time. It, I think the, the constant issues around criminal malintent against the use of the platform for financial grant gain or, or for, would, for whatever reason is consistent across many industries. So um, if I'm in banking, how do I want to use automation to attack a platform to steal funds? If I'm you know, attacking social media um, platforms to, you know, to take over what we call ATOs or account takeover accounts for nefarious reasons. That automation, that technology led attack capability from criminal elements is consistent. And, and, you know, the internet has no boundaries. So you're really, you know, if you're a police officer in a small town in the north of London, you're really worried about the crime in your town. When you're a police officer on the internet, you're worried about crime coming from all over the globe at the same time. So they're well-funded. They have uh, large technical infrastructures. We see um, bad guys using, you know, ML or machine learning all the time. Um, so that's a big, big problem that, uh, chief security officers of uh, global multinationals have to be thinking about and how do they defend against that. So that's a big one. Um, quite frankly, malware is a consistent issue. Um, we think about um, the impact of nefarious developed technology or code uh, for different reasons that can freeze computers, that can you know lock and encrypt information uh, for ransom. Um, these are becoming more and more powerful because at the end of it, it's financialization essentially of criminal acts and, and that's why people are doing it. So I think that consistently is a problem. It doesn't matter if you're a small company and mom and pop you know, shop you know, somewhere in the US or you're global multinational operating out of Europe. Um, it, it's, it's just the reality. And then I guess the, the third area is you know, people's own environments. Um, you know, technology changes on a daily basis. You have developers in and out of systems. You have networks moving around. Um, things can break and keeping consistent capabilities to be understand the transparency in your environment, to be able to apply the control capabilities that should be there and to be able to do the normal health and maintenance in your environment is not easy. That is a full time job unto itself and forget all of the advanced tax, just making sure you're doing that um, in your own environment is super important. Thank you, Roland, so much. I know we're nearly out of time, but I'd love to just get a sense of to what extent do you think tech platforms are responsible for what happens on their platforms? I, I think they're very responsible. I, I, you know, platforms have a responsibility to be transparent about we, how we operate, what we will and will not do, how we secure our platform, how we protect users' data. Um, that's important. I think platforms also have to be responsible for implementing these clear and enforceable community guidelines, what you are and are not allowed to do and do um, put in technologies, programs, and processes to, to enforce those. Um, you are inviting people to use the platform with those guidelines. People, the people that want to use, you know, say TikTok on a daily basis, they're there to share their happy moments. And some of them, they're sad moments. It's their genuine selves that they're putting out there. They're not 
there to, to, to have you know, problem malicious people trying to engage with them. So we do a lot of work um, to focus on taking all of the negativity out and allowing them to do that. Um, and I think we also owe it to our community uh, to provide them with the resources and tools to make their own choices, right? If you're a technology, a social platform or a, a media platform, allow, educate, allow them to understand and make their own decisions about what, um, how they want their information protected, handled, or what, how they want to engage the platform itself. And then, and finally, I think, you know, it's all our responsibilities to create this safe environment. It's just like being a leader at work. What do you do as, as, as a leader at work? You create a safe environment for people to be included, right? You know, diversity and inclusion, I love that last discussion because I'm passionate about the area and this concept of diversity and inclusion, a lot of people forget that inclusion part. But it's the same thing when you're delivering um, a platform to market, um, an important component of that it, it, to, to ensuring that you're inclusive it's, is creating um, a safe place for those people to come and experience that, you know, that joy of creative expression. And by the way, that's what I get to go to do, you know, to work to do every day. Thank you, Roland, so much. I know we've got a question that's come through on chat. Don't know if you have time for me to ask just part of that, which comes from Anne Roberts, who is actually on that panel, which is how do you align that cross-border expectation in security and consumer data space, just as a final question? Well, I think you have to build your platform with the expectation of cross of cross-border um, data. When you're you know, a multinational, you know, a technology that's used in um, hundreds of co countries, you actually have to ensure that your platform capabilities, um, your privacy enforcement uh, capabilities are in line with within the jurisdictions that you operate in. And they're, they're very different. The EU is very different than the United States and Japan is very different than Brazil. And so I think it's, it's going into a business with the thought methodology, the programs, the people, the policies that enable you to do that. And of course, the technical controls in platform. I'm proud of a lot of the work we're doing in the data defense and access assurance space around regionalization of data management, not only access assurance, but how do we think about data uh, residency and, and how we protect the end user through disaggregation of identity to data, things of that nature. And, and those are all super important to be built into the product, not to come as an afterthought. Thank you so much, Ron. That's been absolutely fascinating for you to share some of this with your time when you're on holidays. Incredibly kind. Thank you very, very much indeed.